Thanks, Aki. All right, I got a whirlwind to take you through, so I'm going, those are my disclosures. So I kind of want to discuss uh, patient selection, imaging, case planning, and uh, hopefully we'll get to anticoagulation and follow-up. Uh, as far as patient selection, I think most of us uh, would agree that we want to make sure that we're treating central DVT, as uh, Aki just showed us, and patients who are symptomatic, ranging from significant pain and swelling to full-out phlegmasia. And ideally, when you're choosing patients to treat endovascularly, you want to be able to have them tolerate anticoagulation. As far as imaging goes, usually we just depend on a high quality venous duplex ultrasound. However, I will consider a CT venogram if uh, the DVT is happening after an IVC filter placement, if there's bilateral DVT, if my venous duplex shows continuous flow on the contralateral unaffected extremity, or if there's abdominal, pelvic, or back symptoms. And if the patient can't get a CT venogram because of contrast, then we can always do an MRV uh, non-contrast uh, uh, exams. And I'll show you a couple examples. Here's an extensive left leg DVT, goes all the way from tibials through the femoral junction. And you'll see here on the right, you could see continuous waveform in the right iliac vein. So this is somebody who would absolutely get a CT on. And lo and behold, we find that explanation for why. And this helps for treatment planning. Here is a patient who had an IVC filter placed seven years ago. She presented with back pain, bilateral lower extremity pain, and swelling. So for three reasons here, the filter, the back pain, and the bilateral low extremity symptoms, I'll get cross-sectional imaging, and you can see that's borne out by this IVC and bilateral iliac vein thrombosis in the setting of that filter, shown here on cross-sectional imaging as well. Here, a patient who had uh, uh, prior IVC filter two weeks before her symptoms started, uh, and he got that actually for a very minor DVT, then proceeded to clot everything off. He had baseline chronic kidney disease, so we did this, oh, that didn't play, oh, all right, well that was, um, an MRA without contrast, and you can see you get a great example of uh, bilateral uh, iliac DVT as well as IVC thrombosis. So in terms of the long litany of tools we have in our armamentarium, I'm not gonna read them all for you. My uh, approach to this is be comfortable with many different strategies. And so when it comes to which strategy, either catheter-directed thrombolysis, purely mechanical or pharma-mechanical, here's my summary slide. It all works. And the bottom line is, is you can see data and more than data opinions that are all over the place. Do you use ultrasound? Do you just use standard CDT? Do you use even catheter-directed thrombolysis over mechanical? And people honestly are all over the place, and so that's why I feel like you have to be familiar with everything. The things that influence my decisions are patient profile, so bleeding risk, the volume of clot, and clot location. So I think that the days of multi-day, two, three-day thrombolytic infusions have basically disappeared, and if they haven't, they really should. And then you have to adopt which strategy are you gonna use in your environment? Are you a lysis first, so you put your lytic catheters in, that goes pretty quickly. Do you do an overnight infusion? And then use mechanical techniques just to clean up if you need to, and of course, adjuvant therapy. Or are you primary mechanical or pharma mechanical, hoping for that single session and place lysis catheters only after a period of time that it's not been successful or you're not satisfied? But there are real issues with either of these. One, there's no question, even with purely mechanical, that you're gonna have refractory thrombus or blood loss as part of the suction thrombectomy techniques, and these are real issues. Two, lab time, okay? Can you afford in your lab to stay, you know, keep a lab tied up for, you know, potentially sometimes a few hours to do a purely mechanical case? As far as uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, ICU stays are a real issue if you're trying to decrease cost and equipment costs if you have to open up multiple mechanical cases mechanical devices to get the job done. So here, this is a standard 27-year-old, presents with right leg swelling. You can see the occlusive DVT. I'm going to go through so we can get it to as many cases. Pretty extensive DVT with that tail of thrombus. And in this case, we placed a multi-side hole. Here we used an Echos catheter. You can see there. Patient had an overnight infusion with a very low dose TPA and also low dose heparin, went in overnight, and this was just the thrombolysis check without any adjuvant therapy the next day. 
Uh, here, a patient with prior GI bleeding 10 days uh, in the past, but also is now 10 days status post cervical spine surgery with severe leg pain and swelling. So this is somebody I'm not going to be excited about catheter-directed thrombolysis. So we chose a purely mechanical option. You can see there, here the patient is prone, and you see extensive left leg all the way going up. Again, the patient is prone. And this was strictly mechanical. And then the whole idea is to fix the underlying lesion. And this patient actually was uh, subsequently treated with anticoagulation. Here, a patient who presents with basically phlegmasia, very severe phlegmasia. And the non-invasive study actually showed monophasic waveforms in the arterial study. So here, the idea was, let's get it open as quick as possible. So we were anticoagulating the patient, but then we wanted to use suction thrombectomy for uh, rapid revascularization. We used, in this case, uh, small saphenous vein access, did the venogram, and we were able to get into to both the profunda femoris vein, which you could see there, as well as the femoral vein, uh, the main, what was again known as the superficial femoral vein, using complete suction thrombectomy, to, and there you see the iliac vein is occluded, and here you'll see the penumbra using the separator. With these kind of cases, you basically have to use the separator, otherwise you're going to clog everything up. So this is something you can see us using that separator with the penumbra device, and basically we were able to do this in a single session and then treat the, and you'll see there, treat the underlying agent, put in a stent, and that patient actually did really well. Okay, here, now, patient status post uh, craniectomy, meningioma, had an epidural hemorrhage, gets admitted to our rehab hospital, which is a source of tremendous uh, DVT cases for us, I could tell you, had a left peroneal vein DVT, and this was in the days where they really wanted us to put in a filter, and here the patient got a filter, you could see the MR, there's extensive IVC and iliac vein thrombus, we decided to use the AngioVac, uh, which is a, a very large 22 French device, suction thrombectomy catheter. These patients go on venovenous bypass. Here you can see the venogram, and so we're cleaning up usually from this jugular approach, and it really works very nicely, but it is not like quick like that. It does take some time. This is the follow-up, and we get very nice product from that. I will say one thing about the AngioVac, and I'm going to run through this because I see it's my time to get up. You can see here there's thrombus above the filter. In this case, we decided to use AngioVac to clean out above the filter, but after cleaning that out, we could not get by the filter, so we decided to remove the filter. And this is in a day when we were not routinely putting um, suprarenal filters in. That AngioVac catheter does suck thrombus, but it is not a filter. So for this case, we did not use a filter, and then uh, thrombus did sneak by because we were cleaning up. It was actually one of our quickest cases, and, and everything got cleaned up, but something got by. And this patient actually arrested on the table. We saw it, we did immediate CPR. The patient went on VA ECMO, so you really want to be prepared for these events. And so the summary of that is, put in a suprarenal filter when using the AngioVac. You really want to protect yourself. I see, unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I want to make one point about access. More and more, I like to go posterior tibial vein access as opposed to puncturing a clotted popliteal vein. I think it is a very easy skill to learn because what you want in order to have a good result is you want to have inflow and outflow. And with that posterior tibial vein access, the patient is supine and you can really get a lot cleaned up from below. And, um, and this is why I've done more and more of that access. Thank you very much.